How you doing? So today, uh, I'm gonna do a longer video. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the mentality and approach and just in general about my dear friend, Sean Lane. Um, I met Sean when I was 18, when I was a student at the Atlanta Institute of Music in 95. And um, I started working some with Barry Richmond out of Atlanta, great guitar player. And Jeff Seip used to play with Barry a lot. So I get a call in 96, uh, early, early 96 from Seip. And uh, he asked me if I wanted the gig to be Sean Lane's tech. So uh, I was like, mm, man, I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, can we do Kurt Cobain? Uh, no, nah, I'm just kidding. Well, Kurt was already dead anyway. But uh, so yeah, I, uh, um, I got to work with them. And for many years after that, I, I teched with Sean for many shows and moved back to Memphis. Even though I met Sean in Atlanta, I'm from Memphis. And uh, many years, I was his tech on many shows. Uh, and uh, I got to take lessons from him and hung out with him a bunch. Uh, I was his transportation for a long time. Um, so the first thing that struck me about Sean, I knew coming into this, because I, I saw his instructional videos and stuff before the clinic, but I didn't know that much about him. Um, when I went to music school, I mean, I knew about all the shrapnel guys, but I didn't know anything about jazz or jazz fusion, but his chops were just unreal, just unreal. But when I met Sean, he was the softest spoken, most gentle person. And he was so humble. He was very humble. Um, and that really kind of made me rethink my attitude as a young man, you know, that was in one of the best music schools out there and, you know, young men have egos and stuff and we always want to be the best and the fastest and everything else. Well, you hear Sean Lane play and then, you no, know, nobody's going to be like Sean Lane, but he was so humble. And one thing, you know, he never tried to compete with anybody. He was just himself. And, you know, as he said, you have weird nervousness, but you got to think fast and hear fast. And it's just, it's a whole different mentality. Um, but I progressed so much further after that because to this day, I don't care what any other guitar player is doing. They're not paying my bills. I am. And I pay my bills with, with my guitar, whether it's doing lessons or going on tour with somebody or working in a studio. I've done it all. Um, and Sean had a mountain uh, of, uh, of, of, tracks that he recorded on and stuff like that over the years and he was so humble um humility that's a huge thing always stay the student that's another big takeaway from sean um anybody that knew sean would tell you the amount of books that man would read it was just unreal he would go to the library and he had a wagon and he would fill it up he, the man would read three to six hundred books a year and i'm not exaggerating at all um and it wasn't just that he had uh, a photogenic memory and I'm almost thinking nowadays, and I mean, I'm not a licensed psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever. Um, hell, them people kind of freak Sean out anyway, but if you really look at his mannerisms and for those that really knew him, you know, knowing what we know now, I almost think Sean was actually on a spectrum. Uh, he had, he was very particular about certain things. Um, and you know, uh, uh, very funny about certain things, but his intelligence, um, his intelligence was just incredible and the way he would approach music and everything, um, and his mannerisms. So, um, that's something I wanted to throw out there just as an observation as somebody who's taught a ton of people over the years. Um, and knowing what we know now, um, not that it matters, but it would explain, you know, like Asperger's is what I'm thinking. Cause you look at Elon Musk and, um, I think Sean would have really dug everything that Elon's doing, you know, with Tesla and SpaceX and all that stuff. Um, and then, I mean, Sean was a huge fan of uh, Nik Nikola Tesla, you know, uh, from the actual Tesla, <laughs> not from Tesla. But um, Sean was, he, he would he would read a bunch of nonfiction stuff. Uh, he loved science. Um, Powers of 10 was actually um, supposed to be, uh, I, I'm looking around because I, thought I had just had it. Anyway, Powers of Ten was originally supposed to be uh, the artwork from the movie Powers of Ten, which is a science film that, that uh, he liked a lot, where um, it started with a couple in a park, 
and then they'd use microscopes to zoom all the way into the body and it, there's a part of the body where it looks like outer space and it'd go out like whatever 10 firm i don't know the terms there but it, it would it would zoom out and then you're back you know on earth and it zooms all the way out into space and you end up in the milky way and either way it gets to where it looks about the same but it goes out in powers of 10 um and he powers of 10 live when he did that album he did what he originally wanted to do with the artwork on uh the powers of 10 from warner um which i think they they ended up making him do just two hands or something like that um but that's what it was originally supposed to be um so he read a lot but not only that he could carry on a conversation with you while reading a book and watching a movie and he would follow the whole thing um and uh and oftentimes playing piano or, or guitar but, but he, he liked to kind of play uh keyboard he that i think that's how he mainly got you know he, he i saw him playing keyboard when he wasn't doing a gig or something like that i saw him play keyboard a lot more and i think a lot of it might have been his arthritis and stuff too but um you know he would do all this and, and he could actually be talking about an entirely other movie um and another interesting thing about sean was um he had the ability, uh, and, and I did not know this actually, uh, David Flexer pointed it out. Um, but see, there's me, there's David Flexer, there's Sean O'Donnell, um, and Tony Sutton. Um, we all are more advanced guitar players that learn directly from Sean and we're with him a lot. And there's just something about Sean, like, it was like you would spend days with him oftentimes, you know, uh, um, and you know he and he he'd move on between different friends or whatever but um you know uh um there's a lot of observations that we made after he's died and um uh, david flexer was telling us um a few weeks ago and i believe it uh, but there's a very rare uh uh i'm ambidextrous myself i'm left-handed i play right hand so sean but sean could actually write letters in one hand and numbers in another hand he could write two completely different things separating his brain like that that's uh, uh somebody said that's like one in a million people can do that he also had a photogenic memory um he could recite anything that he read um and when he would talk about a movie he knew the screenplay he knew the the weather conditions behind the film he knew everything about it. he knew every actor in the film he knew the directors uh the 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 orchestra the the pit musicians themselves he could tell you everything about it um the the guy was a genius on a whole different level and i can't really explain it until you meet somebody like him and the only living people i could really think of like that now that most people would know about elon musk is definitely one of them um and maybe uh, uh, I mean he was you know he he was like Einstein or, or Tesla, um, but Ed Witten uh, uh, I think Sean uh, would have really dug him a lot. He's, he's a scientist. Um, but anyway, um, so humility and always being a student; those are two huge takeaways about Sean. Um, another thing is when he would play he always he, he he it was like floating on a feather really I mean, he, he played uh very light strings he played eights um and initially when patrice vigier approached him about making him a guitar sean just kind of blew him off and said what he said to all the other guitar makers and i mean he had plenty of people making guitars you know normally he just they just go right back out the door you know because they weren't what he wanted you know uh, but he told Patrice, he said, I like a really light string, you know, with a really, really low action. Um, and uh, and normally that would chase him off. And he came out with the Vigier Excalibur. And Sean loved that guitar. Um, and uh, and it really was. I mean, with the zero fret and everything, it, it's a great guitar. Um, it still is. Um, so he also liked having that flat radius. Now, see, he had double jointed fingers so he could bend his fingers like that but his movements were so subtle i'm just now learning things that he taught me years ago you gotta remember too i was a kid and i mentioned it to a good friend of mine uh sid wolf out of atlanta who um is one of my teachers from aim and, and still is I, I haven't played guitar in the last two and a half years because uh I, well i was doing a lot of sean stretches and it 
stretched this tendon out so bad that I, I, it became paralyzed one day. Uh, and I had to get carpal tunnel surgery on both hands as well. And the pandemic shut me down and all that good stuff. So anyway, um, Sid helped inspire me and, and, you know, hold my hand, get me back up there, uh, play again, you know. Um, but even Sid, like, um, I knew Sean was something special because we called Sid Yoda. And he is by far the most knowledgeable player I've ever met in my life. An incredible, scary player, even better teacher and even better student. That man's still learning to this day. I have nothing but respect for him. And when I saw him ask Sean Lane for lessons, I was like, wow. Like I said, we called Sid Yoda. But even Sid said that, you know, he is just now discovering things that Sean taught, taught him when he was taking lessons at the same time as, you know, I was in school there. He's just now figuring things out, you know, all these years later. But Sid was my age then. I was a kid, so a lot went over my head. And Sean, you would have to be there to understand it, but he was so smart. And he would ramble on about so many topics. He would just, he'd go over anybody's head. I mean, it was like he owned your brain and it was mush. And, uh, I mean, it would just, it'd be like this psychosis almost. And, uh, it was almost like torture sometimes. I loved every second I spent with me, with him. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, anyway, um, but there's something to be said about age and experience. And Sid, uh, was, you know, I'm 45 now and he was about that age then. Um, and I wish I could sit down with Sean right now with the knowledge and experience that I have now, because I know what questions to ask him now as, as well. But we're trying to figure out a bunch of stuff, you know, still. And, and I mean, we're all making discoveries about him still to this day. So there's a double jointed thing. Um, I wanted to address something else, too. Um, there's a video that I watched the other day of, of a younger kid. Um, he made a lesson, a one minute short, uh, about the uh, pentatonic groups of fives. And um, I didn't mean to drop a house on a guy's sister. Uh, in fact, I didn't drop a house. I mean, like I said, my hands and wrists are messed up. And my rotator cuff's going bad. And, uh, I'm kind of fat and diabetic and all that. I can't lift the house, man. Sorry. Uh, and I didn't mean to offend you or anybody else. All I said was Sean Hybrid picked that. And, and what he was teaching, he was actually correct on this hand. Um, but that's, again, one of those slight little nuances. And the guy's response was, prove it. You know, and I'm like... I guess he doesn't know who I am, but, uh, you know, uh, Sean taught me that lick himself. I was with Crystal Becker, my partner at American Guitar Institute, and Sean was supposed to be our other partner, and we had just gotten done with the Cooper Young Festival, um, and we were at Sounds Good Studio. Sean owned the equipment, Les Birchfield owned the studio, and it was filled with people. Sean's sisters were there, his mom was there, Mamaw was there, um, but, uh, Tony Sutton actually noticed it, and that was Sean's best friend. And Tony actually got on stage to play that gig with Sean. Um, but Tony's like, oh, that's what you're doing right there in that lick. Uh, you, you're, you're hybrid pig with two fingers right there. You know, and uh, Tony's real observant, you know. And then Sean started explaining the whole thing to us. So that is my proof. There's a whole room full of people, and uh, you can ask any of Sean's family, bandmates, whatever. Um, I was there, okay? My proof, I was there. All I was trying to do was show you something new, kid, to kind of, you know, not everybody's your enemy. Um, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to get a lot further in this career if you take advice that Jim Dandy gave me years ago because Jim's a really good friend of mine. I've worked with Jim quite a bit. And Sean obviously got his start playing with Black Oak Arkansas. Jim Dandy always says, be nice to people. Uh, and he lives by that. Jim's one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. But, dude, I took the time to watch your video. I liked it. I thought it was a, a good video, you know, and I took the time to comment, man, and you like freaking out, man. Uh, look, you're never going to improve on the guitar if you have an attitude like that. And that's why I want to talk about Sean being humble. Because if you're going to teach Sean Lane's licks, then you need to know the mentality behind Sean. Um, Sean would learn, if, if he knew somebody knew something he didn't know, he was a sponge. He was always learning. Always be the student. Um, and I was trying to help you with something because the other comment that the guy made was, uh, well, you know, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm not using the techniques that Sean did. You know, I'm, I'm using my own techniques. You just kind of got to do your own thing. Uh, well, if you're going to study a master like Sean Lane, um, who has paved the foundation of many, many years, hundreds of years of guitar players for the future, maybe it would help you to learn it exactly how he did it. And that's all I was trying to do is point it out. So with that being said, I want to show you something. If we pick this, see, you got to remember, Sean was double jointed. And he was very fast. But he was very light to, to the touch. 
if we pick this, it's a very weird angle. No matter how I do this, I can go down, up, down, up, down, up. You know, it doesn't matter how I do it. There's too much thinking involved. If you listen and you watch, zoom in and pause, when Sean's doing this like many others, and he might not always do it, but he showed me himself, okay? There's always a snap on that high note. And that really is what makes that lick or that, that, that sequence. Because it wasn't always five, so he would mix it up. Sean was all about, he, he loved mixing staccato and legato and being unpredictable and mixing timing. Um, and if you think about it, the only two things that we, if we, if we decided we could only play with one note, there's only two things you can play that's, or change, that's timing and dynamics. Watch this. We're going to go pick, pick. You hear that snap, that pop? If you listen to Sean, it's there. Um, and I'm over exaggerating so you can hear it, but um, what if we went, here's the other thing that's really cool. So we're gonna go, I'm gonna hold the guitar up like this. So it's not gonna be fast, but. See finger right there, middle finger here. And he had that right. And then finger, finger. But see, if you're going really fast, you're not gonna see that right there because it's real subtle. Sean did that a lot. And that's where he got that pop sound. And also he would he, he was really fast just going between those fingers. So So that's just uh um he did that a lot and I wanted to point that out. Um so I wasn't trying to be mean, I was trying to help you out, kid. Um you know, uh uh be nice, man. Not everybody's a jerk on the internet. There's no reason to get all hot-headed. Uh, that's a young man's game. I understand you're a young man. Um, but listen to me. Uh, you don't get my age <laughs> without a reason, man. Uh, when an old guy's telling you something, man, you know, that's experience. You know, uh, uh, like I said, I, I, I appreciated your post, and I just tried to comment on it, man. And uh, Whatever, dude, <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, he would use that hybrid picking a lot. And that's something I wish I would have developed right from the get go as a beginner. Um, I did some classical guitar work in college and, um, I can never really grow the nails because I, I was always too much. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was always a working musician. I was always a working guitarist and the nails just never really did it for me. Um, but the thing is, you're coming at it like this. If you're hybrid picking, though, you're coming at it more from the side. Um, and Sean would also use a lot of muting, too. You know, muting notes he wasn't playing. Um, but, yeah, he was his own. That was his other thing. It was, was being original, being unpredictable. That very day, that Cooper Young Festival that I was talking about earlier, um, I asked him specifically because he had just released... Uh, I maybe tried to him, maybe his power is live. I remember he, he gave me a new CD he just released. And of course he was still, you know, he was doing a lot of stuff with Jonas as well. And that was mostly improv. So, I mean, I just asked him, you know, because his compositions were, I mean, everything he did was genius, but the compositions, man, listen to some of that stuff. You gotta remember the technology then was nowhere near what it is now. You can do more with an iPhone right now than you could with all that, with, with all the technology we had back in the nineties, um, early nineties, especially. Um, and I mean, we're talking, you know, probably a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment back then, as opposed to, you know, a $500 phone, you know, but garage band alone has so much stuff. Uh, I, he would love modern day technology. He would love that stuff. Um, but anyway, I asked him, I said, what is the difference between, what is your difference between composing and improvising? And he said, well, it's the same thing. No hesitation. It's the same thing. Composing and improvising. Improvising is, is just composing on the spot. And that's how he would do it. I mean, he would do those cuts, you know, all the layering you'd hear. Um, he would do that stuff live. You know, the, the MIDI layering stuff he heard on Powers of 10, he would play that. He would record it live in real time. Um, but he was such a gentle soul. Um, and his laugh, I miss that laugh more than anything. Um, you know, there, there's uh, uh, many great memories there. Um, I'll tell you another really funny story uh, before I end the video because it's going on 20 minutes now. And, and I plan on doing more because people ask me to share some memories with Sean. But um, 
whenever Buckethead would call, because um, Memo would always uh, weed out his calls. Um, it was kind of a phone phobia, but I get it, um, because when I'm in my own little world doing my own thing, the older I get especially, um, you know, the phone is just, it's just overbearing. You know, you can't get anything done with the phone always going off. So Memo, you know, she'd always go, hello? Oh, Sean there, well, who is this? Well, with Buckethead, he, he, would, uh, he would say, uh, well, this is Buckethead. Well, hi, Bucket, how are you doing? <laughs> Everybody always crack up about that. Memo I'll just calling Bucket. And Memo was so sweet. And, uh, um, I, you know, his family always treated me like family. And uh, I miss her and I miss Diane. And, uh, and I love Tina and Mitzi very much. And, uh, and I, I hope to get to Memphis. We, we got to do another memorial this year for sure because it's going to be 20th anniversary. So anyway, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to ask me. Um, I want to do. We're, we're putting together some of his uh, uh, some of his ideals. We want to actually create kind of a Sean Lane system, if you will, um, and and make sure that material is out there because it deserves to be. Sean is going to be immortal, you know. Um, and that's what happened. I mean, Bach wasn't very popular when he died, but you know, the guys who said he wasn't popular back then, well, who are they? You know, Bach is very influential now, and and you know, Sean was at a whole different level and he became immortal and I knew when he died, you know, he, he just went to another, another dimension, you know? Um, and, and that's, that, that, that's what was crazy. Like when, when, when we went to the wake and the funeral, um, you know, I was really surprised. Memo, you know, she, she was Sean's biggest fan. Uh, and he talked about her, you know, quite a bit. She loved that man dearly. Memo was sitting right by him with a smile on her face and his vigier is right in front of him and he was in his coffin and, uh, you know, Memo, they, they had him dressed up. Memo said, well, we got him dressed to play. We got him dressed to play a show. And uh, she was in her 80s then. She lived another 20 something. No, she lived another 19 years. Um, but uh, I, I thought that was so cool. You know, she stood there so strong. She was still so proud of him. And, and how could he not be? You know, everybody in Memphis is proud of Sean Lane. You know, uh, uh, he was our hometown hero, and uh, you know the guitar community. He, he still to this day is untouchable. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks for watching, y'all, and please like and subscribe. I'm gonna try to interview some of his friends and students, and um, I need to get together at Crafton Barnes uh, because Crafton is with him oftentimes late at night. You know, helping with engineering and stuff like that. It sounds good, and. Uh, and he helped reopen up sounds. Like he, I think he's back. He's, he's moved up north, actually, uh, last I heard from him. But, um, you know, there's a lot of us that were there. You know, the, the more advanced guitar players, we can tell you stuff about his techniques that most people don't know, you know. But, uh, uh, man, Crafton picked up a lot of the engineering stuff like a sponge. And, uh, and he's done really good, you know, uh, uh, getting his material out there the legal way, the right way. And, and he's been helping Sean's family with that. Um, and, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, always be the student, always be humble and don't be afraid to laugh. Sean loved to laugh, laugh, man. Have, don't have a stick up your, uh, yeah, I can't cuss on YouTube, uh, new channel, you know, have a good time. Sean always had a good time. You know, he was, he was, he just, he enjoyed music. He enjoyed playing and he enjoyed good people. Uh, you know, he, he, he really was, he was, he was an incredible soul. Thank you.